All right, fighter progress in Britain. Uh, fascinating article. Um, I didn't. I know a little bit about uh, the Spitfire, the Tempest, and the Firefly. I believe it was uh, more so the Spitfire. I remember as a kid, um, just cool, cool shape of an airplane. But uh, yeah, this is a great article. It talks about the progression of the three planes and how they had to deal with the German flying bomb. Mr. Schmidt, uh, probably saying it wrong, but the ME-262 and the was it ME-163. So. Anyway, fascinating article. Hope you enjoy this one, and let's get to it. Fighter Progress in Britain by Major Oliver Stewart. Major Stewart, editor of the British magazine Aeronautics, has flown more than 100 different type planes since he served as pilot in World War I. This first article in a series for flying analyzes British fighters. British fighter development reached a critical point recently when three new aircraft went into service in the Royal Air Force and the Fleet Air Arm of Britain's Royal Navy. They were the Vickers Armstrong Spitfire 14, the Hawker Tempest, and the Fairy Firefly. They represent the best that British designers can do with the conventional fighter formula. The next step must take them into the region of new prime movers, jets and rockets, and new shapes, tailless and rudderless. Already well known to the inner circles of Allied aviation, the three new machines were held to be less well known to the enemy so that the Air Ministry of Aircraft Production maintained a publication ban until September for the Spitfire 14, until October for the Tempest, and until November for the Firefly. The Firefly shipborne fighter carries in its design a special tactical idea which will be examined later. The Tempest and Spitfire 14 are general duty fighters and their good and bad features are brought out when they are compared with some of the enemy aircraft they are meeting in the battles of Western Europe. The Focke-Wulf FW-190 may be said to be a direct translation into German of the Spitfire 14, but the Mitzerschmitt ME-262, the Mitzerschmitt ME-163, and the Henkel HE-280 are German innovations. If these enemy aircraft are put alongside the new British machines, it emerges that the Germans have been more progressive but less developmental more ready to play with highly advanced and revolutionary ideas, less ready to squeeze all the performance possible out of conventional machines. The Spitfire 14 is a natural growth from the prototype Spitfire which first flew in March 1936. My friend, the late R.J. Mitchell, achieved an act of genius in the Spitfire 1. Put the Spitfire 14 against that earlier child of Mitchell's idealistic brain and the aerodynamic advance of eight years is seen to be small. The thing that makes the Spitfire 14 go so much faster and fly so much higher than the Spitfire 1 is the Rolls-Royce Griffin 65 engine, which drives a five-bladed Rotol propeller. Curiously enough, the engine which Mitchell designed his Schneider Trophy winners of 1929 and 1931, the R engine, using special fuel, gave 2600 horsepower. The Griffin, which although founded on the R, is otherwise entirely new, is officially quoted at over 2000 horsepower. As fitted to the Spitfire 14, it has a two-stage, two-speed supercharger. The Spitfire 14, therefore, is a mature, heavier, and more powerful Spitfire 1. In the Tempest, there is the same story of increased power, but no great novelty in aerodynamic ideas. The Tempest has a wing section, which gives a more nearly laminar flow than the Typhoon wing, and its designer, Sidney Cam, has done much to overcome compressibility difficulties but power is its chief advance on the Hurricane and the Typhoon. The Napier Sabre 24-cylinder liquid-cooled sleeve valve engine is quoted at 2200 horsepower. Now compare these two fighters with the enemy products they must meet. None of them, in standard form, possesses that necessary margin of speed which, under all conditions, would enable them to intercept and deal with the flying bomb. They both, at times, need height in order to achieve extra speed by diving when they are trying to intercept their quarry and reach a firing position. Measures were taken to give the Spitfire a sprint performance for this work against the flying bombs. A short-lifed engine was introduced, which still further increased the power and put the Spitfire 14 in a better position for coping with flying bombs. But the flying bomb, at slightly less than 400 miles per hour, keeping on a dead straight course and never taking evasive action, was nearly fast enough to outdistance the best British fighters available when the attack started. Technical men, who had been studying intelligence reports before the first flying bombs came to England, were of the opinion that the bombs would go too fast to be caught by fighters, and they were agreeably surprised when the fighter pilots, by judicious use of height, managed to shoot them down. 
against the jet-driven Mitzerschmitt ME-262 and the liquid-fuel rocket-driven Mitzerschmitt ME-163, the effectiveness of the Spitfire and Tempest is not yet settled. They can deal with the Focke-Wulf FW-190, but the evidence is that the ME-262 and the ME-163 are a great deal faster than the 190. In fact, enemy fighters are entering the region around the speed of sound. The Mach number, or the ratio of the true airspeed of the aircraft to the speed of sound through the air at the same height, must be near unity for the ME-163, and it may be inferred that the Germans have made a thorough study of compressibility and the special problems of sonic and supersonic speeds. The ME-163, according to the first Royal Air Force pilots to see one at close range, is very small. The wingspan guessed at 30 feet or less. Having an ultra-simple structure with no horizontal tail surfaces, it should be capable of being turned out in quantity at small cost in money or man hours. It may be the vanguard of the interceptor fighters of the future. It is a high jump machine with a rate of climb which, during acceleration at takeoff, must subject the pilot to prodigiously high G. There is no reason why the ME-163 should be clumsy on the controls, as was reported in some newspapers, and pilots who have met its state that it can turn quickly when on the glide with the rocket drive cutoff. A warning was given by a senior Royal Air Force officer at a conference held in Belgium that the Germans might become dangerous with their jet and rocket aircraft unless the Allies found it possible to provide new aircraft to oppose them. The tendencies of the air war in Western Europe, as it is reported in London, support this view. It follows that there is the utmost urgency about Allied turbojet development. Allied jet fighters are already in action. They will be needed in large numbers if there is an intensification of air fighting in the spring. Fighting in the air is entering the region of the speed of sound and designers must face many new difficulties. There is a great need for some means of protecting the pilot against high G. One proposal is to give the pilot a supercharged suit which will grip thighs and abdomen tightly and hold up the blood column under high accelerations. That is the general fighter situation. We are approaching a fresh battle of speed with jet and rocket drive coming increasingly into the picture and the conventional fighter with piston engine being transferred to bombing and other duties. Now for the fleet air arm aspect. The special shipborne fighter represented by the new Firefly, the ferry company has called some of its earlier aircraft by the same name, is a two-seater. The Firefly therefore reverts to the tactical idea first expressed in the Fulmar. The theory may be put thus. In aerial combat between shipborne aircraft, the navigational problems are acute. The use of radio aids may be limited by the conditions of the sea battle. The combat will drift as the aircraft go through the usual turning maneuvers. It is argued further that a pilot flying alone who engages with the enemy when far from his carrier cannot hope to keep informed of changes in his position relative to the carrier. Both are moving and the navigational problems are therefore complicated. So an observer navigator is carried. He is seated some distance behind the pilot, facing to the rear, and he has no guns. His duty is to watch the navigation and to make reconnaissance reports. He concentrates on this duty and leaves the pilot free to concentrate on fighting. The Firefly is maneuverable and has a wide speed range, partly as a result of the Youngman flaps. These flaps, when raised, lie flush with the wing. They are quick acting and the constructing company's engineers claim they can be used for combat maneuvering, somewhat in the manner that the Lockheed Lightning quick acting flaps have been used. Armament is for a 20mm cannon, all fixed to fire forward in the line of flight. The engine is again the Griffin, but the airscrew is a three blader. By adopting the Firefly, the Royal Navy reveals that it still clings to the observer navigator theory for shipborne fighters. The war in the Pacific is likely to shed light on this theory. The points may be summarized by saying that the ordinary shipborne fighter, like the Seafire or Corsair, has excellent performance in top speed and rate of climb, but that the pilot of the Firefly will be in a better position to concentrate on combat and to work the narrower fuel margins. Meanwhile, the Royal Navy, besides putting many United States designed aircraft in the service, has adopted the American style of deck catapult. It is expected to use aircraft up to 30,000 pound weight for deck operation. All right, so fighter progress in Britain. Uh, what'd you think? Interesting, right? Uh, you, you probably knew a lot more than I did. Uh, I seem to learn a lot as I write these articles and read the narration for them. So, uh, very fascinating. The, uh, the Spitfire I knew as a kid. Uh, the Firefly was new to me, so uh, 
very interesting plane, and the flying bomb, the Mr. Smith, uh, the ME262. So, incredible story. So, hope you enjoyed it. Uh, like, subscribe, leave a comment, and I'm Bill Riccio. I'll see you in the next one.